funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, a historically low crime rate is the big headline out of Newark today. The mayor touting a growing trust between cops and the community. When we work collectively, not only can we stop a disaster from continuing to take place, we can reverse that uh, and begin to see a positive outcome. Also, chaos on the Hill. As the year comes to a close, millions face another threat of a government shutdown as Congress rushes to pass not just a spending bill, but funding for Ukraine and Israel. And I'm also very concerned that we're getting the humanitarian aid that is so necessary to get into Gaza. Plus, matter of faith. New Jersey religious leaders join me to discuss the rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and its impact on their houses of worship since the October 7th attacks. Now I say, well, if you go into the city, perhaps you should be a little bit more careful. And I, I, I cannot even believe I'm uttering those words to you right now. And at capacity, animal shelters in the state are overflowing with an influx of pets. It's a, a, a problem that is uh, afflicting shelters, primarily in major metropolitan areas. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Well, after spending years dubbed as one of the most dangerous cities in New Jersey, Newark is riding a new streak, logging an overall drop in violent crime and the lowest homicide rates for the city in more than 60 years. State and Newark leaders today touted the improvements and hailed their approach to treating violence and trauma as a public health issue as the main reason they've been able to chip away at crime in Brick City. But can it be maintained? Melissa Rose Cooper reports. Our young people, um, they need to understand that their situations don't dictate their destination. Destination, They can, but it doesn't have to. A message Alteric Best wants kids passing through the Hub Arts and Trauma Center in Newark to know. For the last 17 years, the founder and CEO of the city's first youth-focused trauma recovery center has been providing a place for young adults to escape their problems in their community while engaging in activities meant to lift them up. I want you guys to understand how, how important it is for you to see the light come on in these young people's face. When you get to see them dream again, when their behaviors start to change because somebody loved on them. The Hub is one of several organizations in Newark being credited for helping to curb crime in the city through partnerships with the Newark Police Department and the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery. We've done over 400 mediations. We've been able to help recover stolen cars and missing children at a rate that is unprecedented in conjunction with our partners um, and ultimately doing the work alongside law enforcement and doing the work that law enforcement cannot do. And this is relationship-based work. And so our partners behind us are the people that we have relationships with and we would not be able to do it without them. Public Safety Director Fritz Frage announcing today the city has seen a drastic reduction in violent crimes. You will see that in 2014, Newark police had reported 95 murders. There is 51, that is a 51% decrease from 95 to 47 in uh, 2022, 24. Comparing murders from 2023 to 2022, we show a 8% decrease from 51 murders last year to 47 murders this year in 2023. And I am pleased to report that our homicide closeout rate which is the, the number of homicides resolved by arrest, is 81% this year, which is phenomenal for our detectives. Data also shows a 13% decrease in non-fatal shooting incidents in 2023 compared to last year, as well as a 9% drop in aggravated assaults. In the middle of the year, uh, we were experiencing a serious uptick in the middle of the year. And I think the evidence has shown uh, that when we collectively work together, law enforcement here, 
that you see on stage, all of these folks that are here and all of the folks out there when we work collectively, not only can we stop a disaster from continuing to take place, we can reverse that uh, and begin to see a positive outcome. It's a whole entire ecosystem outside and it's called Nook. We all work it collaboratively. All the neighborhoods that you know had all these false narratives about how we going back and forth with each other. I mean, these numbers is, is, is a testament that that's a myth, right? Now, we might have some one-offs where people have, the, you know what I mean, disputes that they don't know how to handle. And, you know, so whenever we have these one-offs, um, you know, our job as high-risk intervention is to make sure that the narrative is what it is. It's a one-off. 50 new police officers were also added to the city this year. Community advocates say they look forward to continuing the work alongside law enforcement so the streets are safer for everyone. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Time is running out yet again for Congress to avert a government shutdown. Federal lawmakers are staring down a fiscal cliff to pass a spending bill by January 19th, with money tied to crucial government programs, including funding to Ukraine and Israel, and a second deadline in February when money for the rest of the government runs out. But none of that seems to be speeding up an agreement between House and Senate leaders to pass a dozen spending bills that should have been done nearly three months ago. For the latest, I'm joined by New Jersey Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, who sits on the House Appropriations Committee. Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, it's good to talk to you. Um, I mean, listen, you all are looking at a number of budget headaches going into this new year. Do you see a deal being brokered on these spending bills in enough time? Well, Brianna, first of all, thanks for having me and happy holidays to you. And I don't think we have a choice. I mean, Republicans have not shown themselves desirous of governing um, because of the things that they put aside as they do some of the trash bills and uh, resolutions that they've done. But we don't have a choice here. We have all of our spending bills that are coming due either January the 19th or February the 2nd. And if we don't pass those bills, we do not give the agencies the authority to spend the resources that they need to meet the needs of everyday families in this country, um, international aid and, and, and things of that nature. There's no alternative to this other than uh, these incremental spending bills that um, last for like two weeks or a right. week or whatever. That's, that's no way to govern. A stopgap measure is not something that at least the folks you're talking to would consider at this point? Well, that is not something that we find acceptable. That is not something that is respectful of the needs of our country and our allies, um, we will have to consider whatever the Republican majority puts on the table. But I tell you, we will fight vigorously for our families, our communities, our elderly, our children, our innocent people, and our allies. We'll continue to do the kind of fighting that we did um, this last year and we will continue to try to pursue the progress we made on behalf of everyone in the uh, previous Congress when we were in charge. Well, l let me ask you, are you concerned then about funding for Ukraine and Israel uh, being on the chopping block? We know defense funding in general has been in the crosshairs. I am very concerned about being able to support our allies in protecting themselves, protecting their countries, and ultimately protecting us, Brianna. We're not supporting people just because we want to. We're supporting them because we have a stake in their safety and security as well. And I'm also very concerned that we're getting the humanitarian aid that is so necessary to get into Gaza. The devastation of Gaza and the uh, thousands of innocent people killed there. It is inhumane and it is unacceptable. And this country, the peace-loving, leading country that we have always been, 
we need to seek to be. You know, Secretary Blinken was in Mexico looking at border reform, the immigration policy. Do you anticipate your Republican colleagues using immigration and the border policy as a leverage point in some of these negotiations? Yes, of course I do. Um, and I believe that there are measures that can be introduced in the border that make sense, whether it's technology, we cannot stop people from seeking asylum. We're not, we're not evil. We're not mean. We are not hateful uh, people in this country. So we need to find a way to manage what is coming across the border. Why are they coming across the border? Would they be leaving countries that are prosperous and safe and secure for their families? Absolutely not. Who are we, the United States of America? We tell you. Bring us your refuge, bring us your poor, bring us those who need to be sheltered. That's who we are, and we need to be it in a moment when it's needed. Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, uh, thank you. Happy New Year to you, what will undoubtedly be another busy one. Thank you. The same to you and to all of your listeners. God bless. Well, from gold bars and sweeping indictments to surprising U.S. Senate campaigns, New Jersey had its fair share of big political moments this year, and it looks like 2024 will be equally as significant. Senior political correspondent David Cruz breaks down the top political stories of 2023 and what New Jerseyans can expect in the new year. When 2023 began, Senator Bob Menendez seemed a shoe in for re-election. Democrats' big concern was the potential for a red wave in November's legislative elections. But then... On Friday, the Southern District of New York brought charges against me. And that kind of changed everything, with Democrats calling on Menendez to resign and the senator, apparently unelectable, would-be successors emerged quickly. First Congressman Andy Kim and then First Lady Tammy Murphy, putting the Murphy legacy and the county party line on trial. If anybody can make a run at the county organizations, it's going to be a well-financed, well-known, um, uh, uh, well-liked candidate like Andy Kim. If anybody can put a dent in him, he can. Republican strategist Chris Russell knows how important the county line is. Candidates on the line almost always win on paper. On paper, like you said, she's, she's going to have, you know, an all-out attempt here to hand her all the lines uh, or most of them. Uh, I, I've said this from the beginning, uh, having been uh, on the other side of a campaign with Andy Kim in 2018 when I worked with Tom MacArthur and we had a, a very, very tough race that Andy ended up winning by about a point. Uh, do not take this guy for granted. The Kim versus Murphy primary is going to be the most interesting statewide race, according to most experts. Republicans would need Menendez to be the candidate in order to have a shot at the Senate seat in 2024. Add that to the beating they took in legislative elections, and the GOP could see 2024 as a rebuilding year. 25 and the governor's race is where their sights are set. Russell, who is a Jack Chitterelli guy, says besides picking a candidate, the state's GOP is going to have to reckon with itself. I think the um, party will have a, deci a decision to make about you know where we want to go as a party in this state. Is it a Chitterelli GOP or is it John Bramnick's or someone from the more conservative elements of the party who many still blame for the GOP losses in November? As for Jersey City Democratic Mayor Steve Fulop, who's been running alone until a few weeks ago, he seems unworried about fellow Democrat Steve Sweeney, who's just announced, or Mikey Sherrill or Josh Gottheimer whose enthusiasm for the race will also be determined in early 24. Former Senate President Sweeney is in the mix. There's going to be other candidates, you know, we believe down the road. But I don't think it really changes what what, what Mayor Fulop's going to do. I think he's going to continue to talk about, um, you know, how he sees that we can fix some of the big big issues going on in the state and how what kind of solutions he can bring to the table. I think that, that some of these ha House candidates, like Josh Gottheimer, like Mikey Show, they've got a big decision to make first, which is, are they even running for re-election in 2024? Or are they going to try and focus all of their energy on the governor's race? The thing about these look ahead stories is that when it comes time to look back, you almost always end up saying, wow, I didn't see that coming. I'm David Cruz.
NJ Spotlight News. As 2023 comes to a close, the war in Gaza continues raging. The Israeli military is targeting the central region of the Strip and warning residents, including those at the Al Barij refugee camp, to evacuate to shelters. This after an Israeli airstrike targeting Hamas, militants killed dozens of Palestinians sheltering near one of the last functioning hospitals in southern Gaza, according to a Palestinian medical group. The World Health Organization says efforts to deliver medical supplies and fuel to the hospitals have been difficult, with starving, displaced and desperate Palestinians stopping the convoys in search of food. Here in New Jersey, home to large populations of Jewish and Palestinian Americans, communities are figuring out how to confront the peril of this war. And we've launched a different kind of conversation looking at the issues. Matter of Faith is part of a podcast project aiming to better understand how faith intersects with and influences our world. In our pilot episode, which drops today, I spoke with Rabbi Matthew Gewertz and Imam Dean Sharif about how the rise in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic threats since October 7th are impacting their houses of worship and their advice to the faithful. Here's a clip. You touched on something, Rabbi, that I, I did want to get to. So let's just go there now, which is we have seen a rise in hate, violence, threats against both Muslims, uh, Jews in America, in New Jersey. So if your worshipers aren't feeling safe to come together and practice their faith, and a lot of us really rely on that community and being together in person, how are you helping them to navigate that if if they don't feel comfortable coming to synagogue? It's, it's the one place I would say they do feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. That one hour a week, we meet, meet Friday nights at 530 we have had, we used to get, people thought, oh, you're doing really well, Gortz. You have 180 to 220 every Friday night. And in suburban Jewish arenas, that's considered uh, a good amount of people. But I have 1,300 families. So I know that if, you know, I was selling uh, salami for a living, I would never be effective only, you know, having 30% of people. My point is that since the war, we have 800 people who come every Friday night. And they're not all with gray hair, meaning that people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and they tell me that the one place they know that they're not going to be attacked is in the synagogue. And that doesn't necessarily mean physically. I mean, they're not going to walk around having names called. No one's going to question their faith, their, their ability to exist. It's true. We have security and security costs have gone up exponentially. And we were, I'm not even sure if I told you this, Dean, the night before the holiest uh, day, not the holiest day, but Rosh Hashanah, the new year, we were swatted. We had a bomb threat and we all had to leave eight minutes into services. Mm. So are we safe? Probably not completely, but existentially, emotionally, spiritually, no one feels safer than they do in the synagogue with other Jews right now. I think there may be a false sense sometimes of safety in the, in the house of worship. And like Matthew, the people feel more comfortable in the house of worship because they have a sense that the people that are there are not going to harm them. However, when you when you're when you're when you're in the city and you're traveling in the city, I even had to think about, you know, whether I wanted to wear this kufi, Correct. you know, today. In light of the fact, of course, that the three Muslim men that were killed was shot at yeah. in Vermont yes. were wearing kafayas, right? Which is a Palestinian scarf, right? And they were identified as a, as a result of wearing that scarf. The same thing is true with the kufi when the yarmulke as well. Yep. So, for the first time, I had to think about you know whether or not I was going to wear the kufi. I said I'm going to wear the kufi because that's just something that I traditionally wear. And he knows that I I wear the kufi most of the time. However, I do warn women that they have to be very careful because if they're wearing a hijab, if they're wearing their hair, you know, the, the traditional dress of women, it's very easy for someone to spot them as Muslim women. So they have to be very cautious. And it does mean and sometimes that you dress modesty, modestly, but you don't have to always dress in a way that is obviously a Muslim garb, right? It can be something that is modest and at the same time contemporary. So I tell the women that they have to sometimes be, they have to adjust their garments 
so that they can dress according to Islamic principles, but it doesn't necessarily have to be cultural. So asking them to scale back almost so as not to be a target? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Is, isn't that amazing? Yes. yes. Well, this is not 1933. Mm -hmm. This is 2023. Right. And the idea that, I mean, it makes me, we're not the same religion, to, to, to think that we have to tell our congregants, and by the way, I've been telling mine the same thing. I used to say, show it with all pride, loud and proud. But now I say, well, if you go into the city, perhaps you should yeah. be a little bit more careful. And I, I, I cannot even believe I'm uttering those words to you right now. Because Especially if they're by themselves. For sure, yeah, but, right but you know, right, my, yeah. my parents who are both gone, the only time I'd ever say, thank God they're not here is now, because mm -hmm. my father was barely born in this country and he didn't speak English till he was four, he was made fun of because he had a, a European accent till he was seven. And, but all of it his parents did to fight for the right to not have this kind of behavior exist in America. They came here to run away from that and look what it is that we're facing. And, and Dean, what you just said before, your America, in some ways, has still not been the place where it needs to be. Right. You can find the full Matter of Faith conversation wherever you download our NJ Spotlight News podcast, available now. Listen and share. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, the largest health care provider in Hudson County is urging state leaders to find $130 million in emergency cash for its three hospitals. That's Christ Hospital in Jersey City, Hoboken University Medical Center, and Bayonne Medical Center, all operated by CarePoint Health System. The nonprofit health care provider says inflation and unpaid medical bills have pushed it to a financial breaking point. CarePoint recently launched an online petition addressed to Governor Murphy and top lawmakers calling for the state bailout. The Jersey Journal has reported CarePoint is being sued by multiple vendors for failing to pay for services. State officials have warned of financial woes at the three hospitals since at least October. Local Hudson County leaders are also joining CarePoint's call for emergency help. On Wall Street, stocks opened higher today with the major indexes looking to log one of their best winning streaks in years. Here's how the markets closed. If starting the new year off with a new family member piques your interest, and of course I'm talking about the four-legged kind, you're in luck. Pet shelters are inundated right now. And according to national surveys, rescues are heading into 2024, the most overcrowded they've been in years. You can chalk that up to the pandemic era pet adoption boom that's now leveled off. Ted Goldberg visited a humane society in Newark today, which just happens to be open for adoptions. There's a lot of good boys and good girls at the Associated Humane Societies in Newark. Maybe too many. Uh, approximately 450 animals under our care. You know, if you went back a, uh, a year and a half ago, we probably had 250. CEO Jerry Rosenthal says intake has gone up 30% for dogs and cats from this time last year. It's a, a, a problem that is uh, afflicting shelters, primarily in major metropolitan areas. Hey. That includes Slim Jim, who's lived at this shelter for almost a year. He came in extremely emaciated. Um, he was only a puppy, about seven months old. We didn't think he was going to make it. His prognosis looked very grim. Um, we did send him out to the emergency. They hydrated him, gave him whatever meds he needed. Slim, sit. Good boy. Slim Jim beat the odds and went after recovery the same way he goes after toys and any food within striking distance. He always had that glimmer in his eye, like, I want to fight, I want to make it through, always wagging his tail, no matter how sick he was. It was slow, but he did eventually get better, and now you can tell you would never know he was once emaciated. While Slim Jim has become a big, beefy boy, his energy has made him hard to adopt. Dog Rescue Coordinator Sherry Laraway says an ideal household is full of people who can keep up. An active family, um, older kids, um, any, anybody in, in that range, 
He, he loves people. He loves people. He's been on meets before, and he does well meeting people, even kids. But as soon as they go to pet him, he gets all overstimulated and starts jumping. And I, I, more people like a calmer dog than an energetic dog. This shelter has too many dogs and cats looking for their next home, like Thurman, who's been here for nearly 600 days. Rosenthal says many of them have been surrendered by their owners, which has more and more led to additional animals calling this shelter home. Everything is much more expensive these days too, you know, in terms of food, housing, and you know, people have to make hard choices, you know, and you know, unfortunately sometimes, you know, if they're moving and uh, their uh, housing arrangements and don't allow them to, you know, bring an animal there. There's been a few weeks where we got maybe 10 to 15 dogs out between rescues, adoptions, and fosters, and the very next day, like 15 or 17, sometimes 20 would come in. Rosenthal says the shelter is now working with community groups to help families who think they might have to give up their beloved pets, making it easier to keep their furry friends. People have made the mental decision to surrender their animal once they come here. So we need to get to them early. And, uh, and we, uh, we're doing that by partnering with community food banks and also with our animal control officers who are out in the field, not just you know, picking in stray animals, but you know, stopping, doing educational seminars. These are pets that have been adopted from this shelter just in December. Rosenthal hopes to add more pictures soon with animals finding their forever homes. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And by the PSCG Foundation.